housekeeping items to start with. Um, the first is that this is being recorded, so I want to make you aware of that. Um, the recording will be posted on DHCD's VERP website um, probably tomorrow, along with some frequently asked questions. Um, I want to make sure that people know that this webinar is for eligible organizations who can apply as grantees for VERP funding. So if you are an individual who's looking for assistance, um, your best bet is to contact a VERP grantee in your area. And if you need to know who that is, you are welcome to email me. I'm putting my email in the chat. Um, and I will route you to the appropriate place. We noticed in yesterday's webinar that there were um, several tenants who thought that they needed to attend this in order to get assistance, which is not the case. Um, but I don't think the content will be helpful to you if you are an individual who needs assistance. So please feel free to reach out to me if that applies to you. Um, finally, before we do introductions, um, we will, there are a few points throughout today's webinar where we will pause for questions. So as you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. If you are unable to use the chat function because you're calling in or, or for any other reason, you can also use those um, moments of pause for questions to unmute yourself or raise your virtual hand, whatever you need to do to get um, your question to us. So um, with that, I'll introduce myself and then my team members. My name is Senta Leslie. I'm the Associate Director of Eviction Prevention for DHCD. I direct the statewide rent relief program as well as the Virginia Eviction Reduction Pilot, which is what you're here to learn about today. And I can't tell if I'm frozen. Apologies if I froze up there. Gabby, would you like to introduce yourself next? Yes. Hi, everybody. Um, good afternoon. My name is Gabby Vasquez. I am one, the program administrator for the Virginia Eviction Reduction Pilot, and I am excited to have you all here today. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Elizabeth Speech. Um, I am the Eviction Prevention Policy Analyst on the VERP team, and like Gabby and Santa said, I'm excited for you all to join us for this webinar. Thanks, Gabby and Elizabeth. Um, uh, Gabby, could you move to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so wanted to take a moment to first kind of tell you the story of how we got here today. Um, the story begins in 2016 when Matthew Desmond, the Pulitzer Prize winning author of the book Evicted, um, won the MacArthur Genius Award and used that funding to establish the Eviction Lab, um, which was the first time our country had um, a real comprehensive view, data-based, uh, data-driven view of what the eviction crisis actually looks like in this country. And um, that revealed that Virginia is home to five of the top 10 highest evicting cities in the country. Uh, those five cities are Richmond, Hampton, Newport News, Norfolk, and Chesapeake. It's also worth noting that Petersburg is the second highest evicting mid-sized city in the country. So we have a real systemic problem to solve here in Virginia. And our, our approach to that began um, during the special session in January 2020, when um, the previous administration and the General Assembly um, included a little over $3 million to launch the pilot that we're here to talk about today. Um, that pilot was put on the back burner 
um, because we all know what happened after January of 2020, then came March of 2020, and we knew we had um, a much larger crisis on our hands than $3 million could solve. So VERP was temporarily backburnered while we want, launched the rent relief program, um, but eventually by 2021, the first round of funding was released and it had a very strong focus given the moment we found ourselves in of just stabilizing individual households. Um, we did that through very flexible financial assistance um, and that, that flexible, excuse me, that flexible financial assistance remains, um, but the pilot continues to evolve. So in 2021, we released our second year of funding, um, and that had a stronger emphasis on addressing this problem at the systemic level. Uh, that's when our team began requiring coordination with local courts and incentivizing a regional approach to this work. Uh, we also set aside funds for an optional court navigation element of VERP. Um, and in this third year of funding, which is what we're here to talk about today, um, we have an even stronger emphasis on that systems approach. And as you'll learn as we move through the webinar today, um, court navigation pilots are now required um, for any eligible grantee. I'm very sorry for the background noise. I'll move so that it's less distracting. Gabby, could you, thank you. Oh my goodness. I'm so sorry. I don't think we can hear it, Cynthia, so you're good. So yeah. the third year of VERP funding, um, as I've mentioned, um, is intended to address um, the problem at a systemic level. So um, one thing that I think will become clear to all of you is that our team operates from a framework that it's not the individual households who need assistance um, that need to be fixed, right? It's the system that they're interacting with. When we find ourselves home to five of the top 10 highest evicting cities, that's a systems problem, um, not the problem of, of individual households. So we've structured this funding to address the problem in that way. Um, we also know that we wouldn't get very far with $3 million by taking a household by household approach. Um, so a little bit about the funding cycle. This third year of funding, um, once awards are made and contracts are signed, will start um, January 1st of 2023 and will move through, will last through the calendar year. Um, those of course will be awarded on a competitive basis and each year of funding has grown more competitive and the size of today's webinar and yesterday's webinars indicate that things will only get more competitive. Um, but the good news is that um, the second year of funding, the calendar year 2024 funding, will be renewed funding based on performance and grantees compliance and our continued availability of funds. Um, so grantees who are awarded funding in the for the 2023 calendar year will not need to compete again for funding in the 2024 calendar year, if that makes sense. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so I mentioned this, um, this systems approach. Um, I also want to name the vision that our team is casting um, for eviction prevention in Virginia. So those of you who are close to the um, homelessness space will, will recognize some of the language that we're using here. Um, we want Virginia to become a place where evictions are rare and where the impact on the household is brief. Right now it is 
um, really quite permanent, um, and that the experience is humane um, for the people and the, including the children who are most likely involved. Um, and so that's our that's our vision, and what we hope all of you will join us in in building and forming. Um, and it's a pilot program, which is currently available in several parts of the state, but it's not yet a statewide pilot. Our goal is that w through your efforts and our evaluation, we're able to demonstrate approaches that result in a permanently funded statewide system of prevention and diversion. So um, we do, there's some geographic targeting. Um, I wanna make clear that the funding that we have available is available statewide um, in any, any, loca any locality or combinations of localities can apply. However, the localities that you see listed on this slide, and again, this will be posted on the website, so you don't need to write them all down. But the localities you see posted on this slide will receive scoring preference due to their high eviction rates and or um, the fact that the General Assembly included them in the creation of this pilot program. Very important to know that we will only fund one grantee per locality. Um, we will accept application, more than one application, um, from the same locality, but only one will be awarded. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so we are not requiring a local match. However, we will give scoring preference to applicants who include match um, contributions, either cash matches or in-kind contributions. Um, in previous iterations of this pilot, we did not accept local COVID or emergency resources to count towards match. We have changed that. Um, the emergency has lasted much longer than any of us hoped or thought that it would. So local COVID or other emergency funding resources can count towards your local match. Um, I want to be very clear that in order to receive that scoring preference, you must include documentation of the match that you have secured. Um, we have unfortunately seen um, uh, several times where applicants um, said that they had the match but neglected to include that documentation and therefore were not eligible um, for the preference points. So please remember to do that with your applications. Um, so I'll take a moment to talk about what we mean by systems change. Um, it's a word or a phrase that's thrown around a lot and I don't, it's, it's much easier to talk about than do, that's for certain. Um, so I thought I would um, give you some examples of what that could look like. This is, of course, not an exhaustive list. Um, and I've sort of already touched by sharing our framework, right, that it's not, it's not the households who need fixing, but the system they're interacting with that does. So first of all, when we're talking about systems change, we're talking about addressing the cause for a widespread issue, not the symptom of the issue, right? Um, and it, it's hard work and it requires um, adjustments or changes to policies and practices that are really underpinning um, the, the crisis. Um, it will absolutely require intensive collaboration um, with a, a wide net of, of players um, at your local or state level. So a few examples of what this could look like, and we're so eager to hear um, about the ideas that you have. Um, one example of systems change, which has occurred in at least one district court in Virginia, is um, a specialty eviction docket. So this would allow all eviction cases to be heard on the same day or days of the week consistently. 
Um, and having that consistent schedule would then allow the required court navigation um, services to be available when people show up to court, right? When we know when the eviction hearings are held, we can be there to provide the resources people need. Um, a second example, um, negotiating with local courts to change some of their processes that might result in things like landlords and tenants um, going through a process of mediation uh, before you know, actually going into a hearing. We know that far too often courts are used as almost a debt collection agency, which then has very permanent impacts on, on our young people and their parents and, and far too many low-income renters. Um, I'll, I'll just share two more examples before I move on from this slide. Um, you know, uh, cash assistance is um, life-saving for people. I w often say like the next best thing to cash assistance is an attorney, right? Um, almost all um, landlords show up to housing court with legal representation and very few tenants um, appear in court with any kind of legal representation. So Virginia does not is not a right to counsel state, right? You don't have the right to an attorney in civil matters the way you do um, in criminal matters. But VERP grantees could build partnerships that result in all of the tenants you serve or all of the tenants you serve that end up in court um, having guaranteed legal representation. So that could happen by um, partnering with your local legal aid office. That could be a subgrantee relationship or an MOU partnership. Um, it could also mean partnering with your local bar association. Um, it could also mean, you know, if you're an organization that has a robust fundraising team um, that may also have, you know, a volunteer coordinator or someone who functions in that role, um, you could build out sort of a bench, no pun intended, of um, volunteer pro bono attorneys. Um, and for the fundraisers on the call, you know, you could consider billing that as sort of an adopt a tenant opportunity. Um, this would pair very nicely with specialty eviction dockets. So you could have, you know, a, a handful of volunteer attorneys who are willing to do this work pro bono and they know that the eviction docket happens every Monday. So that will be, you know, their day of service. Um, my last example is just um, the opportunity of pulling together a diverse set of partners that could build out mediation resolutions um, that result in landlords and tenants negotiating repay repayment of rent outside of the court process. Um, next slide, please. So I want to define what we mean um, by prevention and diversion. And for those of you close to the homelessness space, listen up, because we're aware that these are um, these definitions are reversed in the eviction prevention versus homelessness prevention uh, space. So we define eviction prevention as the services that are provided to a household before they receive an unlawful detainer. So before the court becomes involved. And as this slide indicates, that could look like a variety of things, including short-term financial assistance, case management, mediation, et cetera. Our diversion services are offered after a household has received an unlawful detainer. So really the sort of dividing line there is, is the court involved yet or not? Um, because an unlawful detainer stays on your record just as long as a writ of eviction. For all intents and purposes, it's really not that different. So diversion happens after the court becomes involved, after an unlawful detainer has been received. And that could include some of the same things that are offered during the prevention 
um, window, um, but in diversion specifically, you know, it could look like offering that mediation or negotiation between landlords and tenants to come up with a payment plan. Um, legal aid is going to be a critical partner in the diversion space. Um, a moment about who's eligible. So um, units of local government, nonprofits, planning district commissions, um, institutions of higher education can apply if they're doing so in partnership with one of the eligible entities listed above. Um, they can't be the sole or lead applicant. Um, and uh, it's important to note, because this is a change from previous years, um, that PHAs are not eligible um, as an applicant. Um, we do encourage you to partner with local public housing authorities, but we can't grant money to a landlord to pay themselves. Um, and of course, everyone must be registered in our CAM system, and you'll learn more about that if you're um, not yet familiar with it. Um, I, I think it goes without saying, but I, all applicants should have a, a proven history of meeting the needs of low-income households, um, specifically by providing financial assistance um, and having the capacity to um, successfully take on um, what we recognize as a, a challenging um, pilot opportunity. Um, so here's some informa other information about requirements. You have to be registered in CAMS. Again, you'll learn more about that if you're not familiar with it. Um, Want to underscore um, that if you are, well, you will be um, partnering with others and all of those um, partnership agreements, whether they're MOUs or, or some other formal agreement, um, need to be submitted with your application. Um, so th those need to already be shored up by the time you apply and are subject to our approval. Um, we recognize that that can be a heavy lift in the application phase, which is why um, we have extended the amount of time you all have available to work on your applications, uh, which are not due until September 16th. Um, and just a final note here, we can't in enter into a contract with any agency that has outstanding audit findings, IRS findings, or DHCD monitoring findings or any other compliance issues. So this is our first opportunity to pause for questions. I'm very sorry about the background noise I had early on. Um, um, I'm sorry to interrupt, Santa. I I think actually for time, we if you have questions so far, if you can put them in the chat, um, we'll try to get through this next session section and then stop for a pause. If um, sounds good, end. sounds good. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna start off talking about some of the changes that happened from last year's. Um, VERP grant, VERP 2.0, to this grant, VERP 3.0, one of the changes is that programs are required to provide prevention, diversion, and court navigation services. Um, if a grantee is not providing either prevention or diversion services directly, they should subgrant with another entity to provide those services. Um, and if that is the case, the primary grantee is still responsible for all data collection and coordination of services. More information about this can be seen in the guidelines. Um, moving costs and, and application fees are no longer allowable expenses in VERP 3.0. Uh, this is due to the limited funding we have in an attempt to make best use of funding. It has been decided that spending funds on moving expenses and application fees, though important, does not align with the mission of VERP to primarily prevent evictions and keep people in their home. We are also asking that uh, VERP funding 
should not duplicate existing resources and must be coordinated with other available funding sources. Funds should not may not be used to replace mainstream resources. An example of this is um, homeless prevention dollars can often cover the same um, the same population, and we don't want to duplicate funds in that situation. So, being able to coordinate between different public funding sources. For applicants that have received prior VERP funding, it is expected that grantees will amend their current policies and procedures to comply with the current VERP systems approach and program guidelines. Um, applicants with, uh, should be able to describe in their pilot program design how prior VERP funds built and strengthened their current eviction prevention and diversion system, and how current VERP funds will further enhance their system to reduce evictions. So these are the activities that must be included in the pilot program design. I'm not going to read them out because we're about to go through them one by one. And these next slides are very text heavy as this is also going to be posted as a resource. So I might not read through all of it just for time, but feel free to ask any questions in the chat. So eviction prevention assistance. Um, the programs must provide housing financial assistance and stabilization support services available before payer quit notice is filed, eviction diversion assistance. Um, programs must provide housing financial assistance and stabilization support services available after an unlawful detainer is filed. Uh, program must host or support legal aid and mediation between landlords and tenants. Um, initiative and partnerships that promote systems change programs must create partnerships focused on increasing affordable housing options in local communities, working with courts to be part of eviction prevention response, increasing more jobs with living wages, and um, the more. Pilot program design, the court navigation. So this is one of those changes as last year, this court navigation was an optional piece of the application and now in VERP 3.0 it is it must be included in um, the program design. The purpose of this program is to increase communication between judges and the eviction prevention and diversion staff to assist tenants with navigating their court system, inform tenants about other resources, um, and the court navigator program should include on-site staff at courthouses to assist tenants. And then we have some examples listed of potential court navigator activities. And it is expected that grantees, again, will have part, um, existing partnerships with courts and legal aid providers through MOUs prior to submitting that VERP application. Continuing on in outreach and resource navigation, um, grantees must proactively seek out households at risk of eviction. Um, we don't want to place you know the burden on tenants to find service we want to be able to find people who are in need um, language access language access should be prioritized in program design and outreach strategies uh, lived experience programs must provide opportunity for an individual with lived experience either someone previously evicted or experienced housing instability to be involved in the development implementation and evaluation of the local vert project Coordination, um, grantees must actively ensure that there is a coordination among service providers and stakeholders and referrals to SNAP, TANF, WIC, LIHEAP, and Medicaid. Grantees are expected, expected to develop referral protocols with their local Department of Social Services in order to offer, uh, to refer eligible applicants to benefits. Um, the local advisory committee is um, each grantee is required to have significant uh, coordination through a local advisory committee. The advisory committee must include representatives from the following, uh, local COC, workforce development, local DSS, um, legal aid, a representative of the district court and or bar association. Um, we just want to note that that is a new change also from work 2.0. Uh, some grantees had difficulty connecting with a representative of the district court, and so we wanted to uh, have the Bar Association as a um, backup. That could also be beneficial for the local advisory committee. 
a representative of a public housing authority, representative of associations representing landlords, such as the realtors or apartment management associations, housing counseling agency program, conflict resolution, person with lived experience, organizations representing communities of color, organizations with experience serving Spanish speakers and other non-English speakers, tenant advocacy groups, and centers for independent living. So this is listed out more of the eligible activities and examples of eligible activities. So from financial assistance, you can see some examples are short term, rent assistance, ongoing rent assistance, rent and utility arrears, um, stabilization support services. This is one of the most helpful sections of VERP. Um, an example is if my car broke down and I can't get to my job and therefore, and that will prevent me from being able to pay my rent, VERP is actually able to cover that car repair um, and other support. That is what we mean by say, stabilization support services. So other could be child care assistance um, and things like that, that can help keep people in their homes that might not necessarily be rent or utilities. Um, prevention, case management, capacity building, and more diversion is going to be where that court navigation is under legal expenses, mediation services, outreach and engagement, advertisement fees, travel, programmatic staff, and admin costs, which is limited to 5% of the total award. Um, total award is the final amount spent by the grantee at the end of the contract, and it is not the same as the initial contracted amount. All other funds must be spent in order to receive the entire contracted admin amount. So participant eligibility, City requires grantees to use an eligibility form designed to identify households most at risk of housing instability and to have clear policies and procedures that specify household eligibility and the program's approach to meeting their needs. A template, DHC provides a template of the eligibility form if the grantee chooses to use their own eligibility form, these are the factors that must be included. Um, household as a risk factor. So household per headed by a person of color, a single female head of household, number of recent moves within the past 12 months, age of the head of household and whether children are present in the home, involvement of child services or foster care, non-leaseholder status, domestic violence, frequency of law enforcement, invol enforcement involvement at the unit, tenants living in large multifamily properties, and a household's housing cost burden. A housing first approach. So VERP 3.0, we want to be more really underline the importance of this housing first approach, which is probably very familiar to a lot of you in the housing space. Um, but for those who aren't familiar, this approach is guided by the understanding that people need basic necessities like food and a place to live um, before attending to less critical things such as getting a job, budgeting properly, or attending to substance use issues. And so going back to that VERP assessment tool and the risk factors we just went over and however you score your eligibility for your program, we just want to make sure that um, housing, we are prioritizing housing first approach in the creation of these eligibility tools and not screening out applicants based on a lack of household income, as an example. There we go. Um, are there any questions that I see Senta has attended to some? I can read them out loud just for people on the phone. Um, but while I do that, if you have any questions, feel free to continue putting them in the chat, raise your hand, un unmute, whatever needs to happen. So Ian, uh, Ian Baxter asked, um, would you mind elaborating more on what is an appropriate court navigation program in the Example sent to mention it sounded like a referral program slash sub grantee relationship with a legal aid entity satisfied the program requirements. Um, and in response, uh, Senta said court navigation cannot and should not involve legal advice. It does include helping tenants understand the court processes, referring tenants to other resources, which can include legal aid, helping tenants complete court forms, helping tenants get to court, providing emotional support, etc. Um, John Whitfield asked, 
would the eviction prevention assistance be paid from grant funds or from some other source? And then Senta responded by saying eviction prevention financial assistance can be paid with VERP funding. We require grantees to coordinate with other funding available so that VERP is used only when other financial assistance is not available. And Elizabeth added, uh, you'll see the application budget tab, the kinds of activities that can be funded under eviction prevention, which also includes things like capacity building, case management, outreach, and negotiation. Then um, John asked estimated size of each grant, and Santa said, we are not recommending any specific ask minimums or maximums. There's approximately $3 million to grant out per year. Um, Yes, and so that is, does anyone have, does that answer your question, John, or is there any other questions that anyone might have so far? We only have one last little bit to go. How many grants? We don't have a number of a maximum that we will be funding. We only have two point, only, we have 2.94 million to grant out, so I, I guess it just depends on the amount of applications we get and how um, how far we're able to spread the funds. Um, so, Seth, uh, if you want to unmute. Yes. Hi. Um, sorry. I I felt I want I should have put my question in the chat box, but I feel like it would be easier to just explain verbally. Um, so. Um, I know earlier in the presentation, it was explained that there are certain localities that would be, I want to say, prioritized. Um, and I'm wondering if the group has a sense of, for example, like how many points, like like how many extra points you would get. I, and I'm not sure if that would be like an unfair question. But for example, if someone were to put in an application that focused on a locality that's not on this list uh, for the geographic targeting, um, how many points less would that result in compared to someone who who puts in an application that targets one of these specific localities? Just trying to get a sense of like how, I don't want to say dire, but just trying to get a better sense of like how competitive it would be if you are not applying for assistance for this one of these localities, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, we currently have grantees that are not on this list of prioritized. Uh, so not it is not like we are only accepting applicants that are from or funding programs in these counties just so you're aware but also we'll touch more on it as we get into in the next section elizabeth is going to touch on this scoring so i'm going to not i'm going to wait until we get there which might answer your question but it's five bonus points is the exact answer sorry she's right here next to me <laughs> thanks gabby no that makes sense okay Thank you. Uh, and Lauren, for the staff salaries and friend, um, you'll notice in, oh, sorry, do staff, sorry, do staff salaries and friends count as part of a 5% admin fee or is staff time considered direct service? Um, Lauren, it all depends on what exactly that staff is working on. So in each budget line item, um, we do have a section for program staff. So if you know, someone's a court navigator, for example, we would not consider that part of the 5% admin cap because the, the cost of their staff time is directly related to providing um, a service in the program. Um, it looks like a lot of the questions coming in are related to the final part of our presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into that and then, you know, keep putting questions in the chat because like I said, we are monitoring those. Um, so yes, so data collection and evaluation. So, um, you know, in Virginia, honestly, across the country, we really don't have a real time understanding of evictions. Um, so we're really trying to use this pilot to get a better understanding of what evictions look like across the state. Um, so you all will be working closely with DHCD um, and also an outside program evaluator to develop and implement a local or regional process to collect your eviction data. Um, what this will look like for VERT 3 is, you know, two, four reports that will be biannual. Um, and it's expected that grantees will participate with the evaluator in data collection interviews to successfully implement the program. 
Um, and I mentioned this, but in terms, you know, of reporting, there are, you know, biannual reports. So this will mean four reports through our centralized application management system, which is the same system that you'll use to submit your application. And like I mentioned that they'll be used to assess um, your program and the effectiveness of the pilot overall. Um, it is important that the grantee is responsible for tracking all report program activities um, and spending. So if you are working with subgrantees, um, the grantee is ultimately responsible for submitting the report on behalf of the program. So if you have a subgrantee that's working with you, um, the subgrantee won't be able to submit the report. It falls on the responsibility of the organization that we're granting with to fill out that report. And the kinds of things that we ask are, you know, demographic questions like race, ethnicity, age of the household and individuals in the household, but also outcomes related to housing stability. Um, just to go over the application process, the deadline is September 16th at midnight. Um, we always recommend that grantees try to submit as early as possible, just because, you know, sometimes when everyone's submitting at the same time, um, you know, CAMs can freeze and things like that. Um, all applications need to be submitted through CAMs and they will be evaluated as submitted. Um, and just to note that we do have a CAMS help desk and we have that information later on in the presentation, but it, it, we are only available during business hours of nine to five. So um, just keep that in mind as you all are working on your applications. Um, in order to access the verb application, and again, we'll be sending these um, slides out and posting them on the website, but you can go to dhcd.virginia.gov and see the access CAMS button. Um, when you do the program search, you can hit apply and you'll see the Virginia Eviction Reduction Pilot 2023 from the drop down menu. Um, just some tips for those of you who might not have used CAMS before. Um, all work should be frequently saved. You know, as I mentioned, you never know, you know, sometimes the system might be funky or some, your computer might update or something like that. So make sure you're frequently saving your application. Um, we do recommend that you use Google Chrome to fill out um, your application. It's also helpful to work in a Microsoft Word document and then copy and paste that into the CAMS text boxes. And it's important to note that the text boxes can only accommodate text responses. So if you do have, you know, let's say for some of the need-based questions, you have some presentations or visual elements that you want to include, those should be included as a separate attachment and not put in the text portion because you can only see text in the text boxes. Um, this is just kind of what the system looks like. You'll see that you'll put in your project information tab. Um, then you'll see the program budget. So this is where you'll see the different line items like eviction prevention, diversion, um, financial assistance. Um, it's really important to note um, where it says budget narrative. You know, we do believe that your budget um, tells just as much about your program as your program policies and guidelines and program design. So, you know, because there's a limited amount of funding, because you know, this is a very competitive application cycle, it is helpful for us in your application narrative to know um, why you're requesting the amount of money you are, how you're figuring out, you know, how much money your community needs. And um, you'll see to the right of the DHCD request other funding. Um, that's where you'll put in your matching funding if it's applicable to your program. And remember to put the MOUs in the attachments if you do have matching funds. Um, yeah, so you can see here the required attachments, um, implementation timeline, policies and procedures. Um, if you're not using our template intake and eligibility form, which you can find on the templates section of CAMS, um, we do ask that you upload the one that you plan on using. Um, we do understand that the policies and procedures and intake forms and stuff might change from the application to when you actually roll it out, but um, we do ask that you submit you know, preliminary versions of these documents so we can get an idea of what your program design looks like. Um, and just make sure that any MOUs, letter of commitment um, is attached as well, just so that you can get the scoring preference. We can go to the next slide. Um, the application status. So 
um, once you, if you're just saving the application and you're still working on it, it'll show in CAMS as incomplete. Um, you can return to CAMS as much as you want before the midnight, the, you know, 11.59 deadline on September 16th. Um, just make sure that all your work is saved. And then when the application is submitted, so that you know that it was submitted, you should get an email as well. But the status will then change from incomplete to pending. So once it's pending, DHCD has received your application, you will no longer be able um, to edit it, and then um, we'll review applications. Um, and I just to know as well, there is narrative questions in the application, and that's, oh, there we go. So you'll see the narrative questions and you'll see the text boxes. So if you have, you know, images or, you know, a briefing that you might have given to your city council that you want to add to your application, um, you can include that in the attachment section, not the narrative section. Um, this is a overview of how we're going to be scoring the application. So you can see it's out of 100 points, um, but you can score up to you'll see on the next slide the preference points. So the maximum you can get is 120 with the preference points. But, um, you know, need is going to be 20 points. So we'll be looking for things like your pre-pandemic rate of eviction. What we really want to see is why your community needs these resources. Um, we do have at the end of the presentation some helpful resources that might help you with data in telling that story. But um, we will be looking at target, you know, whether you're in a targeted area or not, but just note that, you know, we even have some current work grantees who aren't in those geographic targeting areas. So not being in a targeted area doesn't mean that you won't receive assistance. Um, for the approach, we want to see kind of what your program is actually designed as. So are you including those that lived experience? What is the role of your advisory committee? Do you have everyone on the advisory committee that should be on the advisory committee? Um, in terms of the court navigator program, do you have those MOUs in place? How do you plan on collaborating with the courts? Um, finally, when we talk about capacity, you know, you can have a lot of need and you could have a great idea, but we also want to make sure that your organization is in a position to actually carry out your program design. So we want to see demonstrated experience serving low income households, providing financial assistance, you know, doing those regional partnerships, coordination across different agencies. Um, for those who are current BERT grantees, we'll be looking at your final reports if you were BERT 1 and your mid-year reports if you were BERT 2 and just um, your demonstrated success thus far. Um, you'll see here the evaluation, the, excuse me, preference points. So we do give um, five extra points if you're partnering with a local government or housing authority, if your program has a regional scope, so we define that as serving more than one locality, um, if you have any matching dollars, and then if you serve more than one priority area, and you'll see that we the priority area is those cities and counties listed on the geographic targeting. All right, and you'll see on this slide just some helpful data resources that you know, we found that might help you as you're, you know, trying to figure out, target the need in your community, um, and the, the links are included in those, so you'll be able to access that. All right, and then finally, this is just the contact information for CAMS, the CAMS Help Desk. Again, you don't want to wait until the last minute um, to ask your questions. Um, but you all do have, you know, approximately another month and a half to work on your applications. And then if you have application questions, whether it's about the guidelines or something like that, feel free to email our associate director, Santa Leslie, her email's there. So um, we have about seven minutes left. Feel free to ask any and all questions. I'll start with the couple that are in the chat. Um, Shernita asked if there's a list of current VERP and VERP2 grantees. Um, the governor's office did announcements for those. I can double check if they're posted. They're not on the they're not on the website, but we are planning on updating that the website in the near future to have that on there. So, if you want a current list before it's updated on the website, I can put I'll put my email in the chat, and um, please feel free to email me, and I'll answer any questions about current group stuff. 
And then John is asking, would we be competing against current VERT programs? Current VERT grantees are eligible to apply for VERT 3. So assuming they apply, yes, you would be competing against. Incentives putting in the chat the current um, for grantees and who they serve. Um, are there current grantees willing to share their experience of administering the program? I'm going to go ahead and let the grantees. <laughs> uh, I don't know, Shernita, if you want to put your. Um, email in the chat or um, but I'll let the current for grantees handle that one. Um, we will and just actually the one thing that I can say that might be helpful is um, our independent evaluator RV eviction lab will be um, finishing up their vert one evaluation towards the end of August and that will be um, posted on the vert page so um, you know, you'll have that to look at in terms of what BERT1 did that will be publicly available, so. All right. Oh, there's Sharvela. I see that both Sharvela from the United Way of the Virginia Peninsula and Michelle from home are willing to chat. Um, thank you both for that. And Mary Horner, um, appreciate that. Great collaboration, even before Bert. <laughs> well, if there are no Further questions, we can conclude today's webinar. Um, I'm glad that we were able to stay on time. Um, and of course, our team is always willing to answer any additional questions that you may have. Um, my email address is on this slide here. Um, so please never hesitate to reach out if we can be of assistance. Mary Horner is willing to talk all day about courthouse navigation. So block your you let me. <laughs> <laughs> We appreciate all of your interest and passion for serving your neighbors, the people in your community, and we look forward to reviewing your applications. Thanks, everyone, and the VERP team, Wanda, and I will see.